dance friends, and welcome to the Dance Edit Podcast. I'm Margaret Fuhrer. I'm Courtney Escoyne. And I'm Lydia Murray. In today's episode, we will talk about five pioneering dance theater of Harlem alums who are working to reclaim their roles in ballet history and why that reclaiming is so critically important. We will discuss the three TikTok artists who recently offered holograms of their viral dances as NFTs and what that might mean for other dance content creators, especially creators of color. We will get into Dance Magazine's just released 30 over 30 list, highlighting brilliant dance artists who had breakthroughs or renaissances after age 29. And then we'll have our interview with Marissa Hamamoto, the extraordinary dance artist who is a stroke survivor and the founder of Infinite Flow Dance, which is a nonprofit and dance company that employs dancers with and without disabilities. And she's doing invaluable intersectional work. She's pushing to make the dance world more inclusive on multiple fronts. Uh, Marissa's interview is actually the last interview we'll be airing in a regular Thursday episode. And that is because, as we mentioned last week, we are getting ready to launch the Dance Edit Extra, our new interview-based project, which we are very excited about. So beginning soon, we'll be making our conversations with dancers and choreographers and educators into their own independent episodes. So those episodes will become a premium series that you can subscribe to separately from the weekly roundtable news discussion. And we hope you'll join us for that new adventure. Uh, You can find out more about the Dance Edit Extra at thedanceedit.com. Okay, now it's time for our weekly dance headline rundown, beginning with an absolute doozy of a news story. Yeah, everyone strap yourselves in, grab some popcorn. A feud has erupted very publicly between ballet star Natalia Asipova and Mikhailovsky theater artistic director Vladimir Kekman after Asipova withdrew from performances of Lobayadere in St. Petersburg. Kekman posted a blistering public statement attacking her credibility, accusing her of lying and feigning illness. And according to the New York Times, in a later interview, he stated she would never perform at the Mikhailovsky again. Royal Ballet Artistic Director Kevin O'Hare stated that Asipova was unable to make it to St. Petersburg due to a combination of the Royals' busy schedule and COVID-related travel restrictions. Uh, She subsequently withdrew from a matinee performance at the Royal, citing an injury, and she has not publicly responded to any of this. You know, when I first heard this story, my reaction was very much like, yeah, grab the popcorn, and like, I wanted to make terrible puns about Kekman is the banana king, like, ooh, it's bananas. This situation is bananas. And I stand by that choice. But Courtney, when we were emailing beforehand, you brought up some points about how we need to stop this whole thing of not believing women in ballet or really just women anywhere when they say that they are sick or in pain. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. That's, I think, very much at the crux of the story is just like treating women and particularly women in ballet like they're inhuman yeah let's not do that it's definitely a tradition that needs to be broken and completely completely reformed pennsylvania ballet will now be known as philadelphia ballet this was the name that barbara weisberger had wanted to use and had briefly adopted when she founded the company in 1963 but it was changed because another organization had a similar name Uh, the academy has also been renamed to the school of philadelphia ballet and the second company has become philadelphia ballet too And the Philly Inquirer ran a piece about this with a buried lead, which is that director Angel Correa married dancer Russell Decker. So congrats to them both. I think that was the thing that we were all freaking out about on Slack was it wasn't so much the name change. It's like, cool, rebranding, great. Angel got married? (laughs) Following the departure of producer Scott Rudin in the wake of allegations of abuse and intimidation, uh, Kate Horton has come aboard the upcoming Broadway revival of The Music Man as executive producer. The show is still expected to begin previews in December and will open in February. Daniel Riley was recently named Artistic Director of Australian Dance Theatre, making him the first Indigenous person to lead a non-Indigenous dance company in Australia. So congratulations there. Oh, major. And still more director shifting news. Uh, choreographer City Larby Charcoui will depart Opera Ballet of Landerin, where he's been at the helm since 2015, to take over as artistic director of Ballet du Grand Theatre de Genève in Switzerland next summer. The game of European company director musical chairs continues. 
honestly on both sides of the Atlantic, there's so much shifting happening right now. Oh, yeah, totally. I just think it's interesting how in Europe, it's like they're going from one company to that. It's just the same cast of characters moving <laughs> around different companies. <laughs> but yeah, so much change everywhere. The Places Please project was recently announced. The initiative is a nonprofit fund that will provide $500,000 in rental relief to theater workers based in New York City who have been financially struggling due to the coronavirus shutdowns. According to Deadline, the project aims to raise funds, evaluate applications, and disperse the funds between now and April of next year. It's a much needed relief. And a new study released by the Asian American Performers Action Coalition examining racial equity in New York City arts funding unsurprisingly found that theater companies and marginalized communities were vastly underfunded in comparison to white-led institutions. The study looked at the 2018 through 19 theater season, the last full season prior to the COVID-19 shutdown. Uh, Just one telling statistic in a report chock full of them. Uh, White-led theater companies received nearly $150 million in total funding that season, while theaters of color received $12.5 million. Yeah, it is... Unfortunate just how unsurprising that study is, but we'll, we'll link to some analysis of the report and to the report itself in the show notes so that you can learn more. Paul Feig and Tiffany Haddish will produce a musical dance dramedy titled Throw It Back. The film's protagonist is a high school senior named Whitrell, who has always remained in the background, but after a Miami rapper uh, plans to feature her school's dance team in a music video, Whitrell fights to join the group. The soundtrack will be heavy on Southern hip hop and HBCU collegiate band music. And it sounds like so much fun. (laughs) And Shahadi Wright Joseph is starring, which is the best. Like all the press releases are talking about how she was in The Lion King and in Us and, you know, rightly so. But I will never forget seeing her as one of the original kids in School of Rock on Broadway. Like she was a star from the minute she stepped on stage. So exciting. Mm -hmm. And in a turn of events straight out of our wildest 90s boy band dreams, members of NSYNC and Backstreet Boys teamed up for a benefit performance in Los Angeles last week. Backsync featured AJ McLean and Nick Carter of Backstreet Boys and Joey Fatone and Lance Bass of NSYNC and rehearsal videos of the four of them performing the iconic choreography from the Bye 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 music video went appropriately viral. The performance for Bingo Under the Stars was in celebration of Pride Month, benefiting the Trevor Project and LA Pride. Can we just get more of these team ups, please? I'm I'm living for this. Forever and ever. And also Lance Bass still got it. Mm-hmm. He was nailing that choreo. Yeah. Yeah. They they kinda all were. Yeah. The National Ballet of Canada recently announced the promotions for its upcoming season. Congratulations to Kodo Ishihara, Sife November, Tina Pereira, and Ben Rudison, who will become principal dancers, and to new first soloists Janine Haller and Kelly Skalnick, as well as Brenna Flaherty, Noah Perret, and Genevieve Penn-Nabity, who are rising to the rank of second soloist. Siva! Okay. (laughs) I had to to get that out of my system. Um. Yes. The dance world marked the passing of two more luminaries this past week, Marianne Harkless Diabate, an esteemed dancer, choreographer, and educator who worked to elevate black dance in Boston, died at age 63. And June Finch, a beloved and very influential Cunningham teacher, died at age 81. Seriously, this year needs to stop. It's gotta stop. Um... We actually have one more piece of news that broke just as we started recording, which is that New York City Ballet has announced the lineup for its fall fashion gala. Sidra Bell and Andrea Miller will both make their first ever works for the City Ballet stage following their digital premieres last fall. Bell's piece will be costumed by Christopher John Rogers and Miller's by Esteban Cortazar. It's definitely a more diverse group than in typical years, which is noteworthy. I'm just so excited for that entire gala. Yeah, that's going to be such a wonderful way to come back to that theater. Yes. To see that company. All right. So in our first longer segment today, we want to discuss a story the New York Times ran this past week about five alums of Dance Theater of Harlem, five trailblazing black ballerinas who, during the pandemic, started meeting weekly on Zoom. The dancers are Marcia Sells, Sheila Rohan, Gail McKinney-Griffith, Carlia Shelton-Benjamin, and Lydia Barca mitchell And initially, it sounds like their meetings are mostly about community and comfort, reminiscing about their time with the company. But soon they realized they wanted to do more than that. And they started a legacy council with the idea of writing themselves back into the narrative of Black dancers in ballet and into the broader American cultural narrative. Because 
our cultural memory is capricious and short-sighted, especially when it comes to Black artists. And leaving these dancers out of the story shortchanges everybody. I mean, the dancers themselves, but also their artistic descendants and the whole ballet world. Yeah, uh, these dancer stories were really kind of lost to history outside of Black ballet circles. They mentioned how often when people outside of the ballet world talk about the first Black ballerinas, they only discuss Misty Copeland. That's all so many people know. But of course, so many came before her and laid the foundation for what she and her contemporaries have been able to achieve. Um, Misty and other highly visible Black ballerinas have, of course, talked about that history. Misty, in particular, has posted about it on social media, addressed it in interviews. She has an upcoming book dedicated to that subject called literally Black Ballerinas, My Journey to Our Legacy. Um, But for a lot of people, it still requires extra time spent researching. And many people won't really take that step to dig and find out who else there is or was. Uh, And some things that underpin this issue, I think, are the ideas that legitimacy can only be granted by white institutions, along with ageism and the tendency for the public to only focus on one successful minority at a time. Um, Those factors, I suspect, make it all the more tempting to zero in on, you know, like a Misty or, or, you know, kind of a few figures who are really prominent today uh, to the exclusion of their predecessors. And the gap in acknowledgement or notoriety widens as the new star's popularity you know, garners them even more opportunities, and it leaves these, um, you know, black ballet legends on the margins. The women in the story also spoke about feeling left out of Dance Theater of Harlem itself. They said that they're not often invited to give workshops or consultations on Mr. Mitchell's ballets. So if these things are happening, today's dancers will miss out on these women's vast knowledge and wisdom, both creatively and professionally. Not only can they coach and teach and advise about roles and choreography and technique, but they could be a support system for dancers who are going through what they experienced years ago. And missing out on that ultimately hurts the ballet world as a whole. This also ties in with a recent Dance Magazine story by Teresa Ruth Howard about the varied reactions to Deborah Chase Hicks' death and the divide that reveals within the dance community. She was a huge figure in the Black dance world, but her contributions weren't fully appreciated by those in the mainstream. Well, and something to bring it back, Lydia, to you were talking about, you know, them not often being asked back to Dance Theater of Harlem and feeling like they weren't giving back there specifically as much as they could have. I think this is an issue that goes beyond DTH. You know, dance uh, is such a, an art form that by its very nature, it is communicated from practitioner to practitioner. That is where our history comes from. That is how the styles are passed down. That's how it evolves. And that's how it holds on to tradition. But what we don't necessarily always talk about is the fact that if particularly in these highly visible companies, the um, pool of experiences that are being allowed to come back is very narrow. That in and of itself is pruning and editing the history in a way that is making it perhaps less diverse, less interesting, and uh, less varied. It's how things get flattened out. And so for all that, you know, there's this idea of like preserving it the way it was meant to be done originally. Well, if you're only talking to one or two of the people who are doing it originally, you're getting a really narrow focus. You're losing so Mm -hmm. many perspectives. And so having these artists who many of them do work with other dance companies around the country, particularly coaching uh, Mr. Mitchell's ballets, they're still passing that on. But like... It needs to be everyone. It needs to be all of these experiences because, yes, they worked with Arthur Mitchell and every one of them would have had a different experience of that. And every single one of those experiences is equally valid and important to dance history and our field. Yeah, it's interesting that you pointed out those parallels to things that are happening elsewhere in the ballet world, Courtney, because I was just thinking a lot of this is similar to what happened, I mean, at New York City Ballet specifically. There was this whole thing of, well, why aren't all of these greats who learn from George Balanchine directly teaching his ballets to New York City Ballet Company members. But I've seen countless stories written about that. This is one of the first stories I've seen written about Dance Theater of Harlem's legacy, which, I mean, a similar thing is happening there. And we don't even know because who are the people doing telling the stories, which I think also relates to Teresa Ruth Howard's piece about Deborah Chase Hicks. It's this questions to consider about who's doing the remembering, who is writing which people into their drafts of history and how that ultimately affects who is credited and who is recognized and whose stories get told. And there are stories like these all over the dance world of trailblazing dancers of color who have been effectively forgotten. Yeah, I mean, Lydia Barca Mitchell was the first black ballerina on the cover of Dance Magazine. Massive. Yeah. Not many people could tell you that factoid. 
offhand, you know, like that's like that's important history. That's a legacy that matters. Mm hmm. Yeah. We'll link to the New York Times piece. We'll also link to Teresa, Teresa Ruth Howard's essay. Please go read them both. They're both invaluable. All right. Next up, we're going to talk once again about NFTs. Lord help us, we're going to do our best. This week, news broke that the production house Jadu has helped three Black TikTok creators offer holograms of themselves performing their viral dances as NFTs or non-fungible tokens. Um, the creators in question are Jaliah Harmon, whose hologram features her iconic renegade choreography, Cookie Kawai, who's doing her throw it back dance, and Blanco Brown doing the get up dance. One NFT was minted for each of these holograms, and the creators received a majority percentage of the auction price. And if you're wondering what the holograms actually look like, there's a video of them available online that we'll link to. They're pretty darn cool. And the bigger idea here is that this is a way for Black creators who are so frequently denied even proper crediting to earn both recognition and compensation for their hugely popular work. Yeah, so so this establishes ownership of the dance and ensures that the creator gets paid something. And people can use the Jadu app to dance with those holograms without buying the NFT. Um, but incentivizing use of those holograms is something I'm a little curious about. And it seems like that could make people less inclined to buy the NFT. Uh, it looks mm -hmm. like the Renegade NFT only sold for about four and a half wrapped Ethereum, which is a little less than $9,000. Um, I'd also imagine that this would be most valuable for a dance that has yet to go viral because it seems like that's when it would be crucial to determine the creator of a dance. How long does it take to create one of these you know, hologram NFTs? Just some questions I've had. Which like point to that is that the thing about the idea of like creating an NFT for something before it is inherently valuable is that because of the nature of how NFTs are created, it's like an incredibly energy intensive process that requires mm -hmm. a lot of startup cash investment in order to get started. Also, not even going to get into all the like environmental questions about the computer power that it takes, like, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of stuff mm -hmm. there. But it's sort of a thing where it is a massive upfront investment even to create one of these. And so then, so the idea of like creating one for something that is not yet viral, uh, the question becomes like, is that investment worth it? Does it make sense mm -hmm. to do that? I think like, you know, the obvious upside here is that because of NFTs and the nature of the blockchain, you know, you can trace ownership of it very directly. It is set up in a way that anytime anyone trades it, it kicks back to the original creators, which we absolutely love and think is great. Uh, however, comma, I think the people I would argue that are like really interested in these viral TikTok dances who help make them go viral and who care about it aren't necessarily the people who are ponying up thousands and thousands of dollars right. to purchase a piece of cryptocurrency. I don't know how yeah. much overlap there is between those two worlds necessarily. So it's an intriguing model, but it, it does raise a lot of questions. Yeah. And I think that's why the sale prices for these holograms ultimately weren't that high. I mean, $9,000 is real money, but they weren't as high as maybe expected just because that Venn diagram doesn't overlap the way anticipated maybe. I mean, there are definitely a lot of questions about all of this. I do like how these holograms link the dance permanently with the body of the person who created it. Because mm -hmm. the first time we talked about NFTs, dance NFTs a few months back, it was in the context of emotes, where you could buy the signature moves of certain dancers, but they're performed by animated emotes, not the people themselves. And this model, it's Jaliah doing the renegade. That's the hologram you're buying. And that's a kind of poetic clapback for these creators who initially found themselves divorced from their own dances, who saw them co-opted by so many other bodies and often white bodies. So I thought that was sort of in the right spirit, at least, even though clearly there are a lot of kinks to be figured out in terms of how or if this can be monetized in an effective way. Mm. Okay, so finally today, we want to take a moment to celebrate the fantastic artists featured on Dance Magazine's 30 over 30 list, which just came out. Um, because it's no secret that dance is totally obsessed with youth. And that obsession means it often ends up sidelining all kinds of incredibly gifted, mature artists. It's frankly bonkers that mature is over 30 in dance. <laughs> like, that's insane. But here we are. 
So the dance magazine list recognizes dancers who broke through or started the most successful chapters of their careers relatively late. Um, and that's a small step towards correcting that age bias, which I think we're certainly guilty of perpetuating here at the Dance Edit, too. So awareness. Um, can we actually just start by reading the full list to give each of these artists their their moment in the sun? So this list, Angie Schroer, Antoine Hunter, Olga Paraset, Miguel Gutierrez, Leslie Suget, Teresa Ruth Howard, Ryan Huffington, Pam Tanowitz, Rosie Simas, Abby Zbikowski, Jennifer Hammonds, Stella Abrera, Bijayini Satpati, Raymond Hogue, Annie B. Parson, Monica Bill Barnes, Michelle Boulet, Nell Shelby, Mia Michaels, Dormisha, Sonia Taya, Giselle Mason, Chris Lenzo, Melanie George, Kathy Marston, Jody Malnick, Onye Ozuzu, Vanessa Sanchez, Camille A. Brown, and Kenny Ortega. I mean, that's a list. All of these artists are incredible. And paying attention to dancers over 30 is so important, I think. And one of the many quotes that struck me from this piece was when Onye Ozuzu said, I don't think of myself as a late bloomer so much as I was a late starter. Um, so often when we recognize older dancers, it's because they first achieved success at a young age. But that's not the case for everyone. People can start on new paths at any point in life. Well, and I think also there was a through line that I noticed through a number of choreographers' quotes in this, talking about, yeah, once I realized that I wasn't like the hot young choreographer, to use uh, Pam Tanowitz's phrase, you know, <laughs> you could just, all right, I'm going to go in the studio with my dancers and focus on making good dances and figuring out what my voice is and honing that. And then mm -hmm. whenever the wider dance world came calling and started noticing, it's like, okay, well, you have a point of view, you have all this life experience, you have a lot of experience honing your craft, and that makes for more mature and deep and interesting work. Yeah, it can almost be freeing in a way once you know that there's no longer that expectation of you, I guess. I was just going to say the freedom of obscurity, which is a strange yeah. but yeah. true concept. Well, I think also, you know, there's something to be said about like, okay, yeah, like you become like the really cool new voice at age 18 or age 20 or 22 or whatever. But then... So much pressure. You know, one, there's the pressure of knowing, okay, the next thing I make, a lot of people are paying attention to. But two, there's also a level of expectation of this is what I was successful doing. And so this is what people expect of me. And I think that there is always going to be that temptation then of, do I stick with what I know and have been praised for? W at what point do you allow yourself to maybe try to completely reinvent or go in a different direction that maybe wasn't what you were being called out for with this early success? Mm -hmm. You know, it creates a thing where are you accidentally getting typecasted by getting called out so early when you're maybe still figuring out your own voice? You're put in a box really quickly. Um, another through line that I noticed in a bunch of these profiles was the idea that while dance is focused on the body, your biggest asset as a dance artist is often your mind. And in, mm. in dance, we tend to sort of glamorize the idea of ethereality, of like the performance that exists only in the moment. And then it's analog, the body that is impossibly beautiful for a short period of time and then disappears from the stage. I mean, I do think it's heartening that parts of the dance world at least are beginning to rethink what bodies, you know, quote unquote, belong on stage. And that's thanks in part to the work of some of these artists that are being recognized. But even though bodies are fallible, ideas are durable. A few of the people featured essentially said the key to longevity in this field is to cultivate the way you think about dance as much as you cultivate the way you mm -hmm. dance, um, which I thought was beautiful. Yes. All right, um, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, we'll have our interview with Marissa Hamamoto. So stay tuned. Hey, everyone. Just wanted to say before we start the interview that this conversation does include a few mentions of sexual assault. So please proceed with caution and take care of yourselves. Welcome back, dance friends. It is my pleasure now to welcome dance artist and change maker Marissa Hamamoto. Hi, Marissa. Thank you so much for joining today. Hello, Margaret. Thank you so much for having me. It's so great to have you here. Marissa has, well, she has an extraordinary resume, but really she has an extraordinary life story. She is a spinal stroke survivor and the founder of Infinite Flow Dance, which is a nonprofit and professional dance company 
that employs dancers with and without disabilities. Um, Marissa is also a fourth generation Japanese American, and she has become a powerful advocate for inclusion in dance and well beyond it. She is a keynote speaker who brings awareness to accessibility and who celebrates intersectionality. And she was recently named one of People Magazine's Women Changing the World, which congratulations. I could keep going. She has this long list of accolades. But instead, Marissa, would you tell listeners a little of what you think they should know about your dance story? Sure, absolutely. Uh, it's been a while that I've been able to speak to a dance audience. So I'm very, <laughs> very excited. I get to actually use dance terminology and, and everybody knows what I'm talking yes, about. Yes, talk here. to us nerds. Um, Give it to us. <laughs> anyways, so um, I grew up in Irvine, California. Uh, I attended a predominantly white elementary school. And my earliest memory of experiencing anti-Asian discrimination was when I was only seven years old. And, uh, you know, and I still remember this really clearly in which I was playing on the playground with my Chinese friend, Alice. And, you know, we were a group of boys ran over to us just to make fun of the shape of our eyes. And, uh, you know, and then a couple days later, you know, I have you know, people from my class making fun of me bringing a Japanese bento lunch, which I think is kind of like, if you think about it, bringing a Japanese bento lunch to school is to an elementary school. Is kind of, that's kind of like a luxury nowadays. Pretty cool, and so, actually. But, yeah. But, you know, as a kid, <laughs> like, you know, being picked on like that is really hurtful. On the other hand, um, I attended weekly ballet classes um, at the local dance studio in Irvine. I was the only girl of color in these ballet classes as well, but something about moving my body to music with the other girls made me feel like I belonged. And it became, dance became like my happy place. And so then during my teenage years, I embarked on this mission to become a professional ballerina, but I was very much told over and over that my body wasn't right for ballet. And, but I, I really, I was like a workhorse. And so I just kept on trying and trying and I was doing everything I can to become a professional ballerina, but I, my body just didn't fit that mold. Um, during my during my teens as well, um, I was also sexually assaulted by one of my ballet teachers, and um, and this is something that I've only recently opened up about, you know. And it's um, I'm still honestly, you know, kind of making sense of the situation. But this teacher, who I trusted and considered a mentor, um, not only didn't believe in me. Um, he also compared my body to others and then also sexually assaulted me. So, and you know, when you're a teenager, you know, you don't know how to respond, react. I did not know how to seek help. I didn't tell my parents, like it was a very hurtful incident. Eventually I realized perhaps I need to just take leave from the dance world. So I did, I, I said, you know, what? I remember the day that I actually you know, took my dance shoes um, to the dumpster and put them in there saying, done, not returning to this. Not just symbolic, a literal, here are my like, shoes. Literally, I remember that. Oh. I, I remember taking my point shoes, my ballet shoes. Um, I think I had like a pair, pair of character shoes or something. I can't remember. But I took all my dance shoes, my whole dance bag, and just threw it into the trash can. And <laughs> oh my gosh, I think that's the first time I've ever like talked about I'm that. I'm like um, <laughs> getting anxiety hives on your behalf thinking about that. Oh my gosh. Yeah, like it was just too it was just too painful, yeah, you know. Yeah. And um and definitely the sexual assault was was haunting me, you know, this whole time too. Um I'm sorry to stop you in the middle of your story. Yeah, go ahead. I'm wondering if you're willing to talk a little more about your assault. I don't know how comfortable you are talking about it, but it's one of those things where I feel like the ballet world in particular sees a lot of this because of the structure of the world itself, where the teacher isn't just set up as an authority figure, but students are taught to interact with ballet teachers specifically as absolute authorities. And also because their criticism is all about your body to begin with, then when it's taken into this other context, it becomes that much more malignant. 
I'm not, I'm not even asking a question here. Oh no, please, Margaret. Like, you know, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree with you. Yes. <laughs> I think I just, I really appreciate your willingness yeah. to talk about it because I think so many other dancers have had similar experiences and are still not at a place where they can talk about them. So I appreciate your openness to discussing this. Absolutely. Um, so yes, uh, let's acknowledge that even in this year, 2021, when especially when it comes to classical ballet, it's almost like a formula. You have to have a certain body. You have to ha have a certain, you know, you know, you gotta, you have, you gotta have feet that point. You gotta have hips that, you know, turn out. You gotta have an arabesque that's up here. Like there's all these requirements. And in a way, like, I mean, I like looking at good art too. So in a way, I mean, some of that, has pushed the boundaries of the human body to do things that it normally doesn't you know at the same time let's also acknowledge that dance is a universal language dance has existed since prehistoric times dance is part of our dna and part of humanity and so there's like this disconnect between the dance industry's demands and what dance is at the core so uh, yes, my story of being told over and over that my body wasn't right, you know, you're too fat, you're too this, you're too that, you don't have the right feet, you don't have the right hips, all of this, this is just, this is not just my story. As a mature adult now, like, it's still hurtful to be told those words. When I look at a teenager nowadays, you know, I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe, you know, teachers said such brutal things to a dancer that is this Kids. young and this vulnerable Kids, and yeah. this i i just can't imagine you know like i still can't comprehend it i mean i don't fully i can't say that i fully um and 100 gung-ho with social media either i think there's a lot there's some toxic culture among social media but among the good stuff is that there is a body positivity movement out there. There is, um, oh, you know, dancers like Amanda LeCount who is like killing it out there with, you know, being a plus size dancer. And, you know, and she's, you know, I've worked with her a couple of times myself and just really um, grateful for, you know, dancers like her who are willing to be bold and brave in that regard. But I think um, this topic of, you know, body shaming, you know, using your authority and your position to harass or unintentionally harass any dancer, whether they're a professional or a student or whatever age they meet, is not okay. It's just not. And so I think it's, it's important for, I think, teachers and directors, anybody in an authoritative position to really look at their practices in regards to how they are psychologically affecting their dancers is, yeah. is my opinion no matter regardless of what the the composition is mm -hmm. you know so yeah and it it does seem like thankfully there is growing awareness of the mental health needs of dance students that just as important as training them technically is helping them become resilient mentally and treating them with compassion and empathy so that they're mentally healthy dancers as well as good performers. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, I definitely, I think, you know, having been a dance magazine subscriber since I was, I don't know, like 12 now, <laughs> you know, I think, um, I think the health columns have evolved definitely over the years. Like I see the evolution of the, of your publication as well. So that's, that's great to see, but, you know, kind of returning to my story. Um, yeah, that was a major detour. Uh, yeah, no, no worries. No worries. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so I ended up going to college in Japan to a university called Keio University. It was an all academic school, it's sometimes considered the Harvard of Japan. So it was a very elite private university. I um, went to college to Japan, you know, partly because I felt like I just needed to escape, you know, the trauma that I had experienced here in the States, in all honesty. But what, um, what ended up happening is when I visited campus, when I interviewed for this college, you know, and while I was there, I was like, hey, mom, you know, I, I know I'm not really dancing, dancing anymore, but, you know, I think I'll probably just continue to take a ballet class here and here, here and there in Japan so I can just keep myself 
in shape. Let me just go and observe a couple classes. I didn't even take class because I was not really dancing. So I went and observed a few classes and I realized, oh my gosh, you know, this is the same language I know. It's ballet. It, the bar looks the same. Everything looks the same except how things were run in class were so different from the States and being, you know, being Japanese, uh, looking Japanese, speaking Japanese, but, but having grown up in, um, in the United States, uh, I was just in culture shock. So my ultimate decision to actually go study in Japan was that I was like, you know, there's a lot of lots to learn about my own Japanese culture. And I think I'm probably going to learn this most for the most from the dance world. <laughs> Anyways, in the context of being at this Japanese university, I found myself again, just kind of like the playground during elementary school. I, even though I was amongst people of the same color as myself, I could not find belonging. I had a very hard time finding friends, connecting with other Japanese, you know, students. And so what did I turn to? I went to the dance studio so that, and again, I feel like dance again became this place of home yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I immersed myself again as a dancer. And I think by the time senior year came around, I wanted to dance with a dance company. That was my goal. Um, but one day in 2006, uh, actually July 26, 2006, um, I was in a contemporary dance class. And I remember feeling really good that day. It was just one of those great dance days where everything is like clicking and yeah. <laughs> you're flying and like, okay, this feels good, you know? Um, uh, and in the middle of that, I just started to feel my elbows tingle. And then I, I felt my legs go numb. And then sooner or later, I find myself on the, on the, on the floor of the studio. And, you know, I found myself not able to move my arms, not able to move my legs. I had lost sensation um, throughout my whole body. So when someone came and touched me, I couldn't feel it. Um, I had a panic attack, but I couldn't move. The next day I was diagnosed with a spinal cord infarction, which is a rare stroke in the spinal cord and was told by the doctor that I may never be able to walk or dance again. And yes, and as a dance junkie um, that was living and breathing dance every day, which I'm sure many listeners here are that too. I mean, it was, and the only dance I knew at that time is that you got to be between 5'4 and 5'8 and weigh between 95 and 120 pounds. Sure, and already the, such a small box. That, yeah. that is the only type of dancer I knew. And so, of course, I thought my life, my dance career was over. Long story short, two months later, I did walk out of the hospital. And after I left the hospital, um, I was initially on a high but it quickly turned into a low. The stroke had triggered a lot of trauma from the past. And a lot of this was very much connected to dance, rejection, body shaming, sexual assault, not fitting the box, discrimination. <laughs> like it all like piled on during the hospital stay. But after the hospital stay, you know, as I was dealing with PTSD from the stroke itself. And so anytime I felt any tingling in my body, I would start to freak, freak out. out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would also sometimes have nightmares of the whole episode re recurring. So also because the stroke happened inside of a dance studio, mm -hmm. I was scared to dance. I was just going to ask. One. It feels like the scene of a crime. Yeah. And so every time I would see some dance dance, um, dance poster or dance studio sign or anyone with any kind of dance, like dance, anything, I would black out. And that went on for a while. Um, fast forwarding, I ended up going to grad school. But now it's like I didn't have the outlet of dance anymore. I was scared to dance. And so it was this very kind of dark, depressing time. I kept on telling myself that I am destined to be a dancer. I don't know what that is, but I am destined to be a dancer. I'm going to do something amazing with dance. I don't know what that is, but I'm going to keep going. In 2010, I was at this kind of New Year's 
holiday party-ish place. And it was mostly non-dancers, corporate professionals. Um, and at this kind of gathering, about 100 people, uh, there was a salsa entertainment portion. And this couple came out. They performed. They were not great. Um, but afterward, they got the entire audience to get onto the dance floor and do the six step salsa basic step. And I was blown away. This is Tokyo. Japanese people are not <laughs> known to get onto the dance floor and just dance. Like we're just not that type of a culture. And I'm in the middle of this looking around going, oh my God, why the heck am I so scared to dance? And in that moment, I remember thinking, okay, there's got to be something for me here. And I don't know what that is. A week later, I took my first three-hour salsa beginner boot camp. <laughs> and I remember leaving that boot camp going, oh my gosh, that was amazing. And I did it. And it, it just felt like a huge milestone within my life that I went back and back and back. And then I'm like, you know what? I'm going to make this my new dance career. Now, at that time, I did not know the difference between salsa, uh, Latin ballroom, ballroom, you know, what, what, what else? The tango. I mean, it all just looked like partner dancing, you know. So I spent about a year and, um, you know, got my ballroom dance certification. Um, after all of that, I ended up returning back to the States, realizing that I wanted to spend more time with family. And yeah, I mean, initially I had very high hopes and dreams here in LA. However, I quickly found out that I just did not fit the mold of the Hollywood dancer. What were your initial goals? Sort of entertainment industry dance jobs or... It was commercial. I wanted to explore acting. It's very typical of probably any dancer that moves here. But I quickly realized that I just did not fit quite the mold of the Hollywood dancer. On multiple occasions, whether it was in the ballroom world or, or actually in Hollywood, too, I was told that, you know, Asians don't fit the role of a ballroom dancer. And yeah, there's multiple occasions where I just felt like, okay, I think I would have gotten that role if I was blonde. You know, I was also told by my agent, you know, at that time I had my, 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 my hair was, was dark brown or dyed dark brown, saying you need to dye your hair black because you're not, you're, you're not going to look Asian enough. Oh, if, it's, if it's brown, I can laugh about it now because I'm so out of that world in a way, but it is a problem. It is a yeah. problem. So I'm not really surprised um, about, you know, a lot of, conversation around representation for Asians right now. But anyway, going back to my source, I, at least I can get to infinite flow. Um, so I hit rock bottom in 2014. And I found myself again in that dark spot of not feeling like I belonged. I, you know, accidentally discovered wheelchair dancing. How did you discover wheelchair dancing? Initially, it was, it was just a Google search, a simple Google search of paralysis and dance. I was blown away at the fact that it was possible to even dance without the use of your limbs, because that was the last thing I thought was possible. At, you know, when I, was, when I was in the most acute situation where I couldn't move my arms, couldn't move my legs, uh, lost sensation. I mean, I, I really did not think that was possible. So and then, you know, I found out that one in four Americans, or that is 61 million Americans, have a disability. Yet was, it was very clear to me that people with disabilities didn't have equal access to dance. And so one thing led to another. I was looking for a wheelchair dance partner. I found a paraplegic athlete named Adelpho randomly on Instagram. So we ended up meeting in the studio. He has zero background dancing. Uh, I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing, but after a couple hours of dancing with him or experimentally dancing with him and trying to figure out the rumba, I realized that dancing with Adelpho was nothing different from dancing with anyone else. You know, as I always say, dance doesn't discriminate. And when you're dancing with someone, you see beyond race, color, size, age, gender, sexual orientation, or disability. And this experience was so profound and I felt so called and compelled to share that with the world that that few months later that became infinite flow. 
long story short, we've evolved into this mission to promote inclusivity and intersectionality as a whole. And I would say that what we are working towards here is systemic change. Um, we're using dance as a catalyst to, um, to create systemic change in the world. I mean, in the telling of your life story, you essentially answered my next 15 questions, which is great. <laughs> but I, I want to come back to this idea that you touched on, which is something you say a lot, which is that dance doesn't discriminate. There's a home in dance for everyone. Can you talk a little bit more about what it is that makes dance such a powerful unifying force? And then why are we inside the dance world? Why do we often experience it as exactly the opposite, as this exclusionary practice that puts people mm. into boxes? Well, first of all, I love that dance media is talking about this, you know, because <laughs> um, I, I don't think 30 years ago, you know, dance magazine was talking about this stuff. So it's We're great, that, yeah. you know, your, <laughs> that the public, the, the primary publication of dance in this country is evolving. Um, but yeah, I, you know, first of all, we as human beings, we all have a body, you know, whether that body is missing a limb or um thing or you learn differently or move i mean we all have a body and this body is made to move it's made to express if we go back to prehistoric times dance was used as as like celebration as ritual it was used in so many ways that was just part of daily life and daily ritual or, or you know ritual in general we might not verbally understand each other, but physically, you know, we all have bodies, so we are able to all speak with our bodies. When you see another body that's moving, somehow you can either relate to it or you end up having an opinion about it because it's another body in space and time dancing. Dance is a language that everyone has access to. So this is why dance is powerful. However, in the world of dance, of professional dance, I would say, it becomes about performance and it becomes about, you know, performance looking a certain way. Um, and all of that turns into now segregation and separation. And this is why, like, I believe the dance industry itself, you know, can oftentimes still be, um, not as inclusive as we want it to. But I also want to point out that, you know, I think a dance, the dance world is a microcosm of the rest of the world in so many ways when it comes to um, whether it's, you know, whether we're talking about, you know, white privilege or racial discrimination or um, ableism or all of that. It, 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 it's a reflection of the rest of the world. But, the, the reason why I do the work I do is because, you know, dance is also a powerful tool to change the world. So you show, you know, I'm just saying you show, but you do things in the context of dance that, let's say, disrupts or, let's say, in our case, we are creating, you know, we're promoting inclusion through dance. That can influence the world outside of dance, too. Like, it can work both ways. Like, we're, like, dance is the microcosm of the rest, but the microcosm can also influence the rest of the world. What I will say is that the work I do is not easy. I've basically devoted my life to this work. I've put myself aside to do this work. And now it's like, I mean, okay, now it's like I'm in this whole like self self care journey here of like recognizing that I can't put my, myself second anymore. But this work um, of basically disrupting what exists is not easy. It takes courage. It takes a lot of courage to say, this is not right. There's a better way to do this. I'm going to disrupt it. And I'm going to, you know, even if people, say I'm wrong, I'm going to still continue to do what I believe is right. Um, but I also believe that I am paving a new path, or hopefully paving a new path for dancers to also become change makers. Like, I think what I want to tell dancers is that if you choose to use dance as a catalyst for change, there is an avenue for you. I do want to see more dancers 
embark on this change maker journey. And yes, and I think I think in a, in a year's time or so, I'll probably be creating some accelerator uh, for dancers to, you know, a co cohort of, of dancers who want to kind of take that leap of faith and, and kind of take, you know, kind of combine their um, their desires to create change in the world and combine that with dance, you know, to create change. So, I, so that's something that I would say in the future, I would love to build and perhaps I can work with dance media and creating that co that initial Let's cohort talk, and application please. call. Yeah. yeah, you know, I think even just the Gen Zs that are coming up right now, they're all about like, you know, social justice and being part of something good, wanting to be changed. Like it, that is also seeping into the dance world. I'm glad that you mentioned self care because you are taking on so much, and all of these issues that you are in the middle of are so complicated and so heavy. You, you've mentioned that you are undergoing a metamorphosis, and I'm wondering if you'd be comfortable elaborating on what you mean by that. Um, like, what has been changing in the way that you view or conceive of yourself and your work? Yeah, um, well, let's just acknowledge um, this pandemic for the dance world or for anyone, per, you know, in movement arts um, or just anyone in general. This this pandemic has been very challenging for for but especially for the dance world. I mean, I I mean, I was at a dance studio yesterday and I'm like, oh, my God, this is just amazing that you all are open. And there's people here. It's it's just it's a celebration. Like I mean, I think we can all empathize with empty dance studios and empty theaters and empty ballrooms. And I mean, it's been a tough year uh, for me too. You know, I mean, we were on a roll when it comes to booking and booking and touring and and projects. I mean, we were on a roll, and you know, suddenly all of that got lost. And and yes, we did pivot. You know, I found new creative ways, um, but also, um, also it was like where a lot of the trauma that I hadn't processed again came back all over again, you know, and I realized, oh, okay, maybe this time of just, you know, not having <laughs> a full schedule of performances and um, rehearsals and all this stuff, maybe this is meant meant for me to kind of um, process all this trauma that I thought I processed, but I didn't. So, uh, but, you know, I think, so the, a lot of the metamorphosis is just kind of from a spiritual sense, it's, it's healing, you know, old childhood hood wounds, um, which some of this is, a lot of this is coming from my experience with dance, but other things as well. I think we've all learned during this time that it's okay sometimes to take a break. It's okay sometimes to preserve your energy and spend some time alone or take some time off or um, in my case, it was also just kind of going back to my own body expression and what that is. And I mean, recently I started roller skating and that's been like the, <laughs> like it's my new hobby right now, but it's, it's so like, I'm, I love being back a student and that's been kind of like my way of, um, you know, that combined with just getting back into the studio, whether it's alone or with a partner, like and just dancing without any expectation, you know, just, not like whatever we're doing in the dance studio right now might not necessarily get on stage, but let's just dance and just get back in touch with our bodies. And so, yeah, so that's kind of like, like the metamorph. I, I would say, I, I would say that I'm still going through a metamorphosis and I don't know, this might continue for a while and it's okay. It's okay. But at the same time, it's great that, you know, we're opening up uh, we're going, we're heading back into physical rehearsal slowly here. Yeah, but kind of getting into the groove back of all this is, um, it's great. So, mm -hmm. yeah, light at the end of the tunnel, long awaited light. Um, Marissa, thank you so much for taking the time today. I really appreciate you being so honest, because I mean, that was that was raw. I, I thank you for sharing all of that with us. I'm wondering, first of all, where can listeners go to keep up with you? Where can they follow you? And then what projects do you have on the horizon that we should all keep an eye out for? Sure. Uh, you can follow me at Marissa Hamamoto or at Infinite Flow Dance. 
Um, right now, projects are still in planning in the works. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So uh, yes, just follow me and uh, we will be announcing stuff soon. Um, lots of new ideas, you know, but again, I, ha I usually have too many ideas and I got to like pick and choose and go with what makes sense. <laughs> yeah. We will stay tuned. We are excited to hear more. And I'll link to all of your pages and accounts in our show notes too, so people can get to them that way. Marissa, thank you so much again. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks again to Marissa. She has such an unbelievable story of resilience. And I also love the idea of the pandemic leading to a metamorphosis, which she talked about to her personal metamorphosis, but also in a broader sense, like we're all emerging from our chrysalises now. I thought that was kind of lovely. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining us this week. We'll be back next week for more discussion of the news that's moving the dance world. Keep learning, keep advocating, and keep dancing. Mind how you go, friends. Bye, everyone. The Dance Edit Podcast is a product of Dance Media, publisher of Dance Magazine, Dance Spirit, Point, Dance Teacher, Dance Business Weekly, and the Dance Edit Newsletter. Our hosts are Amy Brandt, Courtney Escoyne, Margaret Fuhrer, and Lydia Murray. Our music is by Celestine, with special thanks to Broadway Dance Center for helping us record those footfall sounds. Find out more about The Dance Edit and subscribe to our daily newsletter at thedanceedit.com. Thank you.